morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this morning's um, Chamber Seminar Series. My name is Lily Daigle. I'm the Programs and Events Coordinator here at the Worcester Chamber. Uh, welcome you all to this lovely, sunny, uh, cold, cold day. But um, we're going to get started momentarily um, with the crisis management and business continuity. Um, we have two great presenters that are very experienced at this presentation today and are going to be sharing a lot of information with you all. So I am gonna go over a couple little housekeeping before we get going on this. Um, I am recording this session. So if for any reasons, anybody would like a copy of it, it will be on the Chamber homepage or you can reach out to myself and I can send you a copy of it probably later on this afternoon when I, when I get it. Um, without further ado, um, I do also want to tell you, we are going to start right away. We are going to have a hard stop at 11 o'clock with this seminar. But if for those of you that have questions still being asked and want to remain on, our presenters are being grateful enough to give us some extra time to make sure that we get to everybody's questions here. Uh, we are going to use the chat box. If you have any questions, please let the presenter speak because a lot of your questions at the beginning may be answered throughout their presentation. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna have a Q and A. We're gonna do a couple of different ways. You can either, I don't know, some of you may be in your little house coats or pajamas or whatever. So our presenters are willing to have folks turn on their videos later on. You don't have to, if you choose to, you can. Um, this way we can see and have a more interactive Q and A. If not, again, use the chat box at the bottom of your screen um, for questions. And I do want to thank our support uh, sponsor that supports the Chamber's seminar series for many years, TD Bank. Um, unfortunately, uh, they were not able to join us this morning to give a couple of remarks on their sponsorship, but the Chamber is very grateful for uh, TD Bank's strong support with all the seminars that we are able to provide for you folks. Um, we have a seminar every month, but um, we are very, very grateful for them. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to our presenters. And I have Linda Marie Nolan. She's the Director and Undergraduate and Graduate Business Programs at Anna Maria College. And along with one of her colleagues, Dr. Seatone, and he's the Director of Division of Disaster Medicine. And he also is a professor. Um, he's got a, a long, long uh, bio here, but he's also a professor at Anna Maria. So thank you, folks. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you. This morning, we are actually going to go over a number of different items, including effective emergency management and crisis leadership emergency management planning, the application of crisis management model to business continuity, the what ifs and solution considerations during a critical situation, emergency preparedness, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Dr. Siatone. Well, thank you, Linda, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, uh, let me, before I, I, I hit and talk about this um, very uh, uh, shock and awe kind of slide, um, I'll just give you a little bit about my background real quickly. I'm actually a kid from Shrewsbury. I grew up uh, uh, and spent most of my childhood in Shrewsbury. Uh, I went to um, University of Massachusetts Medical School uh, and residency there in emergency medicine uh, and spent six years in the faculty. Uh, I've now been um, 20 years on the faculty at Harvard Medical School uh, and work at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So I built my career around this um, relatively new medical initiative called Disaster Medicine. It's been around for maybe 30, 40 years, um, but we're still continuing to define it. Um, the, uh, and, and in my personal background, I was a commander of a federal disaster team, I, uh, which, which is based at University of Massachusetts, um, was fortunate enough to command that team at Ground Zero 9-11. Um, did a number of other international deployments, um, also wrote a textbook in disaster medicine, and really have been, again, as I said, defining disaster medicine. And, and the reason I'm here today talking to you in the business world um, is because, first of all, what disaster medicine really is, is the marriage of emergency management with crisis healthcare. 
So from that perspective, um, we all in disaster medicine have to be experts in emergency management. Now, we're going to talk about uh, today, emergency management and crisis leadership as it applies to the business world. And what Linda and I hope to do is to have not, not a, a death by PowerPoint, we're going to have a, a number of slides here, but not too many, uh, but more of a conversation talking about what, what the current situation we're in today, um, answer any questions you might have, and then also talk about the future. How do we do this better in the future? Um, <clears throat> so if you, if you look at this, um, this should be pretty shocking to you. Now, this looks at one industry, the healthcare industry. But in 2020, as, as you can see, um, it was really a, a, a tale of two worlds, really, uh, during this COVID crisis. Um, first of all, COVID did take us by surprise, uh, but also made us operate and proceed in really completely uncharted waters. <clears throat> While we did have some historical precedent of pandemics, um, 1968, uh, 1957 to 58, um, they didn't come to the level of, of this crisis now, the, the numbers of, of um, hospitalized, the numbers of deaths. Um, and also, we really don't have muscle memory from that. The closest we come to this is, is uh, 1918. Of course, none of us were there. None of us had muscle memory of that. But that was also a different kind of experience, too. So the lessons that we learned then really are not entirely applicable today. It's a much different world today. Um, healthcare is much different. We are much more advanced in healthcare. The way we uh, travel the world is much different. You know, all these different parameters are different. So really all of us in healthcare, in business, just around the world are doing uh, this for the first time. This is, these are really uncharted waters. Um, so that's the definition of when emergency management needs to kick in. Uh, if, you, if you look at this slide, it, it, should, it should really, not maybe not surprise you, but it, to a certain degree, maybe shock you, right? When you look at the, just the healthcare industry in this case, $323 billion were lost in the healthcare industry because of that idea of tale of two worlds. Throughout these last uh, almost 12 months now, you know, in the United States, you were either fully engaged and in fact, perhaps being um, overwhelmed by the surge in the healthcare industry, um, or, and or at the same time, you were in another place where um, uh, visits are down and, and you know, the overall patient uh, experience um, and patient volumes are, are down to the point where you're actually, you know, working at 50% capacity or perhaps less. Um, so it really caused this, 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 and that moved around the country as well. So it caused this really dilemma of, you know, how do we, how do we operate in this situation? But I think if I were to tell you in 2018, or if I were to show you this slide in 2018, um, so that I had that crystal ball could predict what's going to happen in 2020, I'll bet that that 0.09% um, of loss that was spent on preparedness will be a whole lot higher. Um, but we don't have that luxury. So again, that's where emergency management comes in. So I'm going to ask Linda to, to make a comment in a moment about maybe some other industries um, uh, related to this sort of loss. I mean, we know there's been plenty. But let me also make an overarching statement before we get into this um, about emergency management and why we need it. So I spent my career in disaster medicine, which means I've been going around for the last 25 years saying like chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, right? And we need to do stuff to prepare for these low frequency, high acuity events. And that's always been the, the dilemma of our, of our area, of our specialty, is trying to convince people, um, organizations, industries to actually put funding, put resources, put personnel towards preparing for something that may in fact never happen, these low frequency, high acuity events. And it's a hard sell. It's a hard sell for, uh, for understandable reasons for you know almost across the board. But if you think about it, there's one business that's almost the poster child for emergency management and the importance of emergency, ma emergency management. And that business is, there may be more, but the, the one that comes to my mind is the airline industry, okay? What is it that allows us to get onto this metal tube, fly at 35,000 feet, you know, for eight, 10 hours and, and sleep and rest comfortably? Um, what, what allows us to do that is the knowledge that those pilots in the cockpit have put in thousands and thousands of hours of preparedness um, in the simulator, all of these different steps to prepare for these low frequency, high acuity events. They may never encounter them in their entire career, but should they, we are comfortable that they will be able to handle that because they prepared so much. So if you think about it for a moment, emergency preparedness, emergency management um, in that industry enables the entire industry. Uh, without that, the industry wouldn't work. You wouldn't feel comfortable flying, and there goes the industry. I don't know, Linda, if you have any other thoughts about that. But. Actually, I do, Greg. Um, my career, my former career, was dealing with insurance companies, and I've actually worked on a number of catastrophic teams 
after a disaster has hit, whether it was down in Florida, Homeland, hometown Florida, um, when it was Hurricane Andrew, uh, businesses were supposedly prepared for a disaster. We found during the disaster, they weren't prepared. Um, buildings were imploded, people's things were gone. Um, they weren't prepared for what ifs. Uh, my husband always says to me, well, you're kind of like the Debbie Downer because you're always saying, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? I said, probably because I dealt with so many insurance claims for years after years after years, you get a little bit pessimistic and you try to prepare for the worst. Um, what we've found with the pandemic is businesses thought they were prepared. Um, if we have to close, for a week, if we have to close for a month, um, we'll be okay. We have enough savings stored up, but they had absolutely no preparation or game plan in place for a pandemic that has lasted a year. Um, and a lot of the businesses have closed, employees have been let go, uh, mental illness has spiked drastically during the pandemic. We have students who are at home, parents who are not equipped to teach. Um, it, it snowballed. So the Debbie Donner in me, um, I said to my husband, obviously nobody had a plan. Um, and he said, oh no, they had a plan. I said, well, you've been home teaching. He's a teacher. And I said, you've been home teaching. It's been ugly. So no, there was not a plan or there was a very short-term plan, not a long-term plan. Um, there wasn't anything in place that could deal with this big a pandemic. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is to share some of the information, the experience that we've had with disasters. Um, next slide, Greg. So well, before we go to the next slide, the, you know, so we operate in disaster medicine and, and, and in this case, emergency management. Um, we're, we're simple, simple minded people. So we operate on something we call the disaster cycle. And that has four phases that go around in a circle. It's mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. And it just continues to go. What gets all the attention is the response. It gets the attention of, you know, if there's a mass casualty incident, if there's a, a natural disaster, an earthquake, you know, all lights, all cameras are on, you know, the response, here it is. And then that's done and off we go. But the reality is emergency managers um, and specialists like us uh, spend the majority of our time, 75% of our time, in fact, um, outside of that response, in fact, maybe more outside of that response phase. It's all in the mitigation, the preparedness, and then the recovery. So let's look at each one of those because they directly apply to businesses and emergency management. So mitigation, mitigation are all the steps that you can take to uh, lessen the effect of the disaster on you, on your organization. So anything that we do um, to, to lessen the impact is, is mitigation. Preparedness is for some of those industries that actually have to be functional in disaster, certainly a healthcare industry, responding entities, but also in business to a certain extent as well, depending on where you are. How are you going to prepare for what you do essentially when the disaster strikes? So first you're gonna mitigate, you try to minimize the, the, the impact of the disaster, but then you're gonna prepare you know, okay, we've done that, but the disaster has struck. How are we, if it's just a basic, um, uh, if it's just a basic um, kind of uh, 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 impact on us, how are we gonna manage that? What steps are we gonna take ahead of time? What are our financial contingency plans? What are our personnel contingency plans? You know, how are we gonna modify, you know, over the summer we saw some of this in, a, in, in, in you know, kind of real time uh, action, how I'm, I'm sorry, how um, restaurants um, kind of move their, their um, seating arrangements to outside and outdoors to the extent that they could. You know, all these different ways of preparing. It's it's great, it's, it's good to do that on, on the fly and kind of, you know, roll with the punches. It's much better to prepare and learn how to do that ahead of time. Um, and then recovery is equally important. The recovery phase is when we look back at what we did, and we're gonna be doing this soon, whether it's six months from now or a year from now, we're gonna be in the recovery phase. So we're gonna look back and say, okay, during this global pandemic, and at least maybe in the United States, you know, what did we do right? What did we do not so well? And how do we improve upon that? So this is really how we operate. So let's get into it uh, in a moment. If you can go to the next slide, Linda, please. 
Um, so what is emergency management? You know, what, what is this idea of emergency management crisis leadership? What does it do? Well, uh, as my friend um, Craig Fugate, the former FEMA director, uh, uh, likes to say, emergency management kicks in in your business when your daily organizational chart can't handle it, can't handle what's going on. Uh, that's when emergency management kicks in. And, and because of that, it, cre it, it essentially takes the chaos um, of the ongoing crisis and disaster and brings it back to organization. That may be a short period of time. It might be just a short impact. You might have a water main go. You might have an IT failure uh, for six hours and it's resolved. And now suddenly you're back into a more organized state or it might be much longer term like the pandemic we're living in now. Um, so that's really what emergency management does. Um, how well it works, which we'll talk about a little bit now, really is a reflection of how you've treated emergency management prior to the event. Is emergency management something that you have, uh, you know, in the basement next to the broom closet that you just take out and dust off, uh, you know, whenever a crisis is about to happen? Or is it integrated into your C-suite, into your daily operations? And, and in a moment, I'll tell you how we do that in the hospital level to a better degree. But Linda, I'd like to hear how you, what you think about that as far as business. So working on a catastrophic team for a huge insurance company for years and years, it never ceased to amaze me that, oh, we have everything. Everything's in the back of our cars. Well, everything's in the back of our cars. We didn't know what was gonna hit next. Um, we didn't know it would be a hurricane. We didn't know it would be a tornado. We didn't know it would be a flood, but they thought we were prepared and we really weren't prepared. Uh, we found that when we got to Florida, we thought we had the knowledge, the systems, the processes, everything in place. And when we got down there, the banks were gone. So we had checks that we were going to be cutting to customers who had lost everything. There were no banks for them to go to. Um, when we got down there, there was no power. So we're sitting on you know, folding chairs with a fold up table and we're handwriting claim reports. Um, we thought we had the plan in place. Um, and we were prepared for the disaster. We weren't. Um, we found a lot that we didn't know. And we weren't asking the right people when we created our plan. We didn't have the people at the table for the emergency management team. Um, we weren't properly prepared. We didn't have all of the stakeholders in the same room deciding what our processes and procedures were going to be. We, didn't, we did not prepare well. And we so found you, out when we got there, it was a disaster. So you've just touched on something that's going to be a recurrent theme throughout this uh, next 45 minutes. Um, and that is what I say all the time about preparedness is better the planning than the plan. It's okay to have a plan. It's good to have a plan. But I think, uh, as Mike Tyson said, um, you know, all good plan falls apart when you get punched in the face. Uh, something like that. I think Eisenhower said the, the, something similar to that as far as plans and when they uh, first contact with the enemy. Um, the problem is that you can have a plan, but disasters take left-hand turns, take right-hand turns all the time. And your plan is a linear thing. So you have, it's okay to have it. It may work a little bit in the beginning. It may work throughout the entire disaster. You don't know, but we, be prepared to pivot left to right when the disaster does. And that's why it's the planning process. It's actually getting together with your C-suite team, with your planning team, with your emergency managers and future crisis leaders um, uh, when a crisis happens to do, go through the planning process, because that's when you're really gonna build that ability to pivot. Now, one way that we did it in healthcare, as far as making emergency management you know, more relevant and taking it out of the basement and bringing it up into uh, management uh, is, you know, we, we tried to um, convince everybody and make them understand that, you know, all the steps that we take, not all, most of the steps that we take in emergency management, like in the healthcare field, let's say, really are, are, are steps trying to optimize um, our processes. So they actually have applications to real time, everyday practice, everyday operations. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit like the lean processing, right? So a lot of what we do in emergency management, let's say in a hospital, is to try to streamline those activities um, so that when a crisis does hit, there's no less bumps in the road and there's less bottlenecks. Um, but if you think about it for a moment, that actually reflects back on daily operations. So we put emergency management under quality assurance. Um, so it could be as all the, a lot of the steps that we take are actually to increase the quality and the efficiency of our organization. And if you do that, and anytime you can bring preparedness for low frequency, high acuity events into 
to some degree, daily operations, you're going to get a lot more buy-in than this. You're going to be using it and doing these processes a lot more on an everyday basis and therefore be able to pivot and manage these things as these crises come up. Because crises don't give you a heads up. They just happen, um, as this one did. So let's if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, what are some of the, you know, when you become a crisis leader, when the crisis strikes, what are some of the traps that we get into? And this is just kind of basic, very, very basic stuff, just to give you an idea of how crisis um, leadership really differs from everyday management. So one of them is the scope of the situation. Every day when you operate in your business, this is your, your, your view. Um, you're able to see the full picture. Whatever problem you're solving, this is it. You know, you hit the space bar, please, Linda. Um, the problem in a crisis is, Oftentimes, especially in the beginning, this is your only optics on the situation. You don't have the full optics. Um, now that may paralyze you uh, and you may not be able to function, but actually a proper crisis leader, a good crisis leader and an emergency management uh, system uh, understands that, you know, this is the view I have now of this situation. I'm gonna act on it because I have to, but I understand also there's, there's probably more to this. Um, so I may get more information later. I may have to modify how I do. So this idea of scope of the situation is not something that should paralyze you. Um, because we don't know what's coming down the road with this um, with this pandemic, particularly last spring, we had no optics on what the fall was going to be. Is it going to be a second surge or not? You know, what's it going to be like? We start going through this phase reopening over the summer. Oh no, now we're going to kind of reverse some of that. You know, you don't have the full scope of the situation, the full optics, but you can still operate if you understand that and have a good team and a good management team. Um, Linda, if you maybe go to the next slide. I'm sorry, so then you know that this is the full uh, thing. You'll eventually get that full thing. Now, next slide, please. So here's the other problem, situational awareness. Um, you probably, as the, as the emergency manager, as the management team of your business, will not, again, have full optics on the whole situation, um, nor maybe will you be able to do that because you're kind of, kind of on that macro managing level and you're gonna have people, depending on the extent of the, of the crisis, reporting to you their perspective. So what I like to say about this is, and what we teach in the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative, which I am uh, faculty of at Harvard, um, is this idea of, of, of the, the cone and the cube, right? So there's a cone and the cube. This is the disaster, okay? This is the crisis, the cone and the cube. Space bar, please. You have one person um, uh, reporting to you who's looking through peephole A. Space bar again, please. You have a second person who's reporting to you looking through peephole B. Space bar, please. When they come and report back to you, you're going to get essentially, and one more space bar, you're going to get essentially two reports. The person looking through people A is going to say, I've seen this crisis, I've seen this disaster with my own eyes, I know exactly what it is. It's a triangle in a box. I've seen it, this is what we're dealing with. The person looking through people B is going to say to you, I've seen this situation, I've been on the ground, I know exactly what's going on. It's a circle in a box. I've seen it with my own eyes. Well, you have to understand that Again, people bring these, these optics to you from different perspectives. Um, so again, it's not to be paralyzed by this and say, oh, I can't function because I got two different scenarios. It's to say, okay, I understand that it may not be right in each case. It's not, it may not be a triangle in a box. It may not be a circle in a box. Uh, but if I were to assimilate those things and put them together, I can maybe say, okay, you know what? Be given their perspectives, this must be a cone in the cube. The situation actually must be a cone in the cube. But this idea of situational awareness is also going to change as long as you understand you're not necessarily getting full optics on the crisis, you'll be able to proceed through it um, as it goes on. Next, next slide, please, Linda. Another thing about crisis leadership, a crisis leader does not stand alone. I remember walking into Ground Zero 9-11 uh, with my team, uh, DMAT Massachusetts 2, again, based at University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School a terrific team to this day. Um, and I remember, you know, walking in there with, we had 54 people with us. And, and the first thing that you think is, oh my gosh, uh, you know, it was so devastating. Just the first glimpse of ground zero as we walked in, um, you know, for as far as you could see undulating piles of destruction going, you know, 10 stories up, two stories down, everything on fire, everything smoking. It was really awful. Um, and the first thing you feel, you feel is like you're inadequate. Like there's no possible way that either you or your team um, can actually affect any positive change on this. It's not possible, it's too enormous. But then you have to realize that no one person stands alone in a crisis and, a, and, and crisis leadership is really all about that. You're working as a team and, and it's not the fact that you have to go and fix this yourself. You are a piece, you are like a, um, a cog uh, in a large, large machine. Um, and that large, large machine is going to actually fix this crisis. 
Um, you're just a piece of it, but you're an important piece because that machine won't function properly without you. And this is what you have to convey to your team in crisis leadership as you're actually actively going through the crisis. Next slide, please. So crisis leadership is all about teamwork. And if you look at this idea of unity of effort and speed of execution, um, that's required, let's say, in something like this, this Ferrari pit, uh, pit stop, you realize that this really takes a tremendous amount of organization. And this is not something that you want to do on the fly. All right, all these 12 or 15 people who are all doing separate tasks to make this one thing happen um, should not be and have not um, been meeting each other here at the crisis. They have not introduced themselves to each other the first time at this pit stop. They've been practicing over and over again. And while yes, they may have a plan, it's this idea of you know planning and working together so that you can pivot when the crisis does. Next slide, please. So this idea of everyday operations in your business, the C-suite, the management team, are going through decisions, making decisions, make, taking actions, you know, to make sure the business stays afloat, you know, you're in the black, make sure you're, whatever operations you are, if you're making something, if you're doing whatever it is that you're doing is, is running smoothly, but you have time on your side. All right, you have the time to discuss it as a management team, um, think about different points of view, how should we proceed, um, maybe even test some things out, oh, that didn't work so well, let's do it this way. Time is on your side, that's management. The crisis leadership, that type of leadership, um, you don't have those um, luxuries, you don't, time is not on your side often. Uh, you have to um, you know, work quickly and you might have to make some very, very important decisions in very short time. Um, also, you may not have all the information as we just talked about. So typically in management, you, you probably have all the information, or at least most of it. In a crisis, you may not have all the information, yet you may still have to make these important decisions. So this is, again, the idea of taking your, your, your C-suite team, right, your executive team, and making them into crisis leaders when that need should arise. Um, and again, I'm gonna ask Linda just to come on this. I know she has experience in this, um, but um, how do you do that? You know, and it's all about that planning process. You have to listen. It, you really have to ask the difficult questions. Um, who's gonna do this? How's it gonna be done? What if it doesn't work? Um, more times than not, ineffective leaders walk in, it's my way, a highway, they're not asking all of the participants who should be at the table to participate in making the decisions. Um, I call it the, the fire drill. Um, when a crisis hits, if the leader is just, you know, barking out orders and hasn't asked for who's the experienced person when it comes to this, who's the experienced person when it comes to this, um, everybody's running around in a circle. So your, your Ferrari, if those people weren't properly trained to do their one piece and asked, okay, what do you do well? Um, everybody would be running around the car and nothing would get done. Um, more times than not in a national crisis, catastrophe, a disaster, if the planning process has not occurred, you have a lot of people running around in the circle um, and accomplishing nothing. Um, what we found with the pandemic in particular is, oh yeah, we had a plan. We had a plan. Well, we didn't have a plan. You know, what do you do when you can't open the door? The restaurants who can't have full capacity. What do you do with all of the employees? What do you do when the income isn't coming in? Um, the who, what, where, when, all of the questions weren't asked before the disaster happened or the catastrophe or the pandemic. Um, some businesses were lean and efficient, um, or as I call them, the lean mean fighting machines, um, and they will make it out through the other end and they'll be okay at the end of the pandemic um, because they did have somewhat of a plan and they were flexible and they, they said, well, you know, okay, we have to modify. This is what we're doing this week, but next week, well, we don't know what we're doing. Um, so the, the plans had to be fluid, um, and they had to really be able to adapt. Um, the businesses who, who couldn't are going to fail. Um, our, our school is a prime example. Um, when we had to send our students home, we were prepared. We could go and we could teach remotely. Um, when we came back, we had plans in place to protect, to be socially distanced. Um, to do proper testing. So 
you know, the, the plan was a bigger team working and the leadership team listened. So that's key. You have to listen to the people at the table and then implement the plans. Okay, maybe we can go to the next slide, I think, and then Linda's going to take over for a couple slides. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So, so there, there are different <laughs> kinds of leadership as well. Um, and you all know this too, you're leaders in business and you know the different leadership styles. Um, there's a leadership by authority, and this is like the, you know, the military, um, maybe police, fire, et cetera, where there's a hierarchical um, way, there's a, you know, a, a, a general, a, a colonel, a, you know, et cetera. Um, that's one way of leadership. Next slide, please. One more. Then there's this idea of leadership by influence, right? So I'm just an influential person. People believe in me. Um, I, I say it as it is. I tell the truth. Um, I try to convey the good and the bad and the steps I'd like to take. That's by influence. So people believe in me. Next uh, couple of space bars. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to build our influence beyond our authority. And this is something we teach at the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative all the time. You're going to have some authority, most likely. Um, but how do you build your influence beyond that? And I think, you know, I'm not going to, you know, really get into great detail of this, but I think some of the failures um, in COVID-19 um, were the idea that, yes, there are authority, author authoritative figures, there's policymakers, et cetera, um, but perhaps we didn't um, buy into it well enough. I don't know if that's our fault. I don't know if they didn't educate us well enough. Um, but perhaps, you know, with things like mask wearing and social distancing and, and all these what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions that we had to do for COVID, you know, to bridge ourselves from, um, you know, the, the start of this pandemic to effective therapeutics and vaccines, which is where we're starting to get to now, though we still have to continue with our non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, perhaps that, that influence beyond authority wasn't built. And perhaps that's why the United States had a um, a harder time with this than a lot of the rest of the world. We had a much higher death rate. Um, but again, that's another conversation to have. The idea is to, to build your influence um, beyond your authority. And that I think is a really effective crisis leader. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Try one more time in advance. <laughs> Temperamental. There we go. Okay, so, so to wrap up my piece of this, um, uh, really emergency management is this idea better than planning on the plan. You can have the best plan you know, on the planet. It can be 500 pages long, which is ridiculous for a disaster plan. I've seen that all too often. I've gone to places, oh, so where's your disaster plan? They put on a, a three ring binder, at least in the old days, a three ring binder that's bit this big and you know nobody ever reads that. And certainly in a crisis, you're not gonna read that. So um, you know, it's better to be smaller and, and more efficiently stated actions. But again, that plan is not gonna get you from A to Z. It might get you from A to B, C, D. It's not gonna get you from A to Z. It's that planning phase. It's that, that planning that you do with your team. Um, I think the Navy says we fight like we train and we train like we fight. Um, very important to do. Um, and that way your, your executive team will get you through the business, uh, through the crisis, get your business through the crisis um, by effectively planning together through the mitigation preparedness and then recovery phase so you can make make it that much better so next slide linda i think this is yours exactly what you just said um we need to be prepared we need to create plans we need to get the people at the table to make the right decisions um and i came from a company that had binders on binders on binders on what we were going to do in a disaster um the binders collected a tremendous amount of dust. And when it was boots on the grounds and the teams had to be there and deal with the disasters, well, this wasn't in the binder. This is not what we're supposed to be doing. Well, no, it wasn't what we were supposed to be doing. Um, and you, we had to change quickly to react, to deal with the disaster that we were in. Um, our response was planned. We had these lovely binders and it told us how we were gonna handle it. Uh, we got to Florida and to New York and New Jersey and it didn't happen the way the book had said it was gonna happen. Um, the leaders at the time that I worked for were the screamers. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And when we got there, we said, that's not gonna work. Um, we needed to respond. Um, we needed to get the disaster under control and we needed to 
come up with a plan where we were going to recover from the disaster that we were dealing with. Um, we had to be flexible. Um, our best laid plans changed within a day um, so that we could actually help people who were in need. And I think we're finding that in our pandemic. Um, at this point, Greg, I think, do we want to open up the screen to our viewers? Yeah, so I mean, what we'd like to do is try to make this more interactive now. You've heard some basic kind of principles that we, we operate in in emergency management and healthcare emergency management as um, <clears throat> the program that Anna Maria has. Uh, and, and we'd like to maybe talk about a real-time event right now and, and get some of your input on this and also maybe perhaps questions. You know, we're in something right now uh, that we're, it's a crisis that we're dealing with. Um, we're in the middle of the COVID crisis, but we're in that phase now where we have the vaccine rollout and that's doing better in some places and not so well in others in different ways. Um, at the same time, while we're getting, you know, new strains and just a real, you know, the, the, the virus is on fire, just a real surge. Um, uh, so showing a little bit of improvement in the last um, short time, but really we're still in that red hot um, second phase, essentially, um, or second wave. Um, and, you know, how do you manage that as a business? And, and at the same time, you're operating under the constraints of, um, you know, some of the some of the guidelines and actually rules that are being put out on the state level um, as far as how your business needs to, to run. So it's, it's a difficult time. You start throwing in all these different multiple variables in a time during the crisis. Now, you know, there's there's no no fault to be laid here. Um, I don't think anybody prepared well for this. You know, we talked about pandemic planning. We tabletop drilled it. We did other things, you know, in the last 10 years, um, but really didn't anticipate. We anticipate a lot, but not all of the, the factors and the variables that we had to deal with with this. Um, so this is uncharted waters for everybody. Um, how are you, I guess the question to everyone is, or if you have questions for us, you know, how are you and how is your business handling this, this vaccine rollout? I've done some consulting for businesses about how, you know, how do we bring the workforce back in? Do we, do we stagger them? Do we, um, how do we do the, you know, if there's a positive, how do we do the contact tracing, all these different things. But, you know, what are some of your issues now, I guess, with this vaccine rollout uh, would be a question if anybody would like to talk about it. We could ask you to turn your videos on and your your volumes, turn yourselves back on. Hopefully. <laughs> Lily. Yes. I'm actually gonna pick on you. Oh, sorry. So I know you're at the chamber. So what I'd love to ask is what's the chamber doing? What's the chamber doing to react to the crisis that we're in right now? Oh, you had to put me on the spot, right? And this is I come back. <laughs> <laughs> and this is being recorded. Um, I don't really know. Okay, so I am actually going to ask one of our students, um, Daniel, mm -hmm. if you could um, turn your camera on and your voice. Um, I know you are up in Canada. And I would love to hear from you what's happening where you are. You're one of my students and I know you're not back here in Paxton. So tell me what's happening where you are. Uh, good morning, Professor, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am in uh, Whitby, Ontario, just about uh, 45 minutes east of Toronto. And currently we are in a lockdown again. Um, we were oh. up to 3,000 cases a day like a month ago. Uh, they had shut down like the region of Toronto uh, since early December and just because the cases were so high and they weren't seeing any changes so Boxing Day, so December 26th, um, they had shut down all of Ontario and we thought it was going to be two, two weeks to a month um, but they kept on extending it and about two weeks ago um, they had put us into a state of emergency where it was a stay-at-home order, you know, police could follow you around if you um, were, were out and they like, didn't have a reason why you could get fined up to $750 and it, it's worked. Um, there's been some strain on small businesses and uh, other issues because, you know, you see the big corporations, they're allowing so many people in, even at limited capacity, the parking lots still always look full um, while the small businesses have to stay home. But um, 
the cases have gone down. We're now yesterday for the first time since November, we've had like just around a thousand cases per day, which is good. Um, we were supposed to open up today, actually. But uh, as of Monday, they extended the lockdown another two weeks. So hopefully come the beginning of March, we're, we're opened up again. But uh, in Ontario, we're still locked down and just have to listen to the news and see what uh, the provincial government tells us and go from there. Mm -hmm. Were they prepared, Daniel? This time around, no. I think earlier, you know, through March when the pandemic was real you know the whole world went to lockdown i think at that point in time yes they were prepared they were on top of the ball and they were making changes like immediately and they were effective but now there's a lot of flip-flop excuse me flip-flopping and going back and forth um we want schools open but then we can't have businesses open um stuff like that so i'd like to say I want them to be prepared, but I just don't think they are this time around. And, you know, adding on two weeks here and one week there and certain regions can be open, but others can't. It's just, it's, there's imbalance and I don't think they're prepared. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'd also like to ask Lily, do you want me to come back to you yet or not? Linda, Linda <laughs> I have a question on uh, Judy in the audience here. She's yes. She's asking the question, have businesses seen an increase in employee sick time due to routing office visits being down? And with the increase in employees being out, how has that impacted in organizations? What I've found from the businesses so that I've heard from, um, it, what has happened is a number of employees have been using more and more of their sick time. Uh, whether it's to care for elderly parents, it's to care for their children or to educate their children. Um, I've also found that um, statistics show that mental illness for family members, for employees have spiked. Um, employee assistance program calls have gone through the roof. Um, companies being short staffed aren't servicing the needs that they need to do. They're not, they're not operating in full capacity. Um, your employees don't come in. It's very difficult to run your businesses. So yeah. I'm sorry, Lily, was there something else? Now she said that the question was geared more to um, any business owners in the audience, if there was any in there. She was trying to find out. Well, here at the chamber, I know like at the beginning, we, like everybody else was, caught off guard we did not we were not prepared for anything like this matter of fact we're so like ancient here our computers and everything I mean we didn't have like even like you know to be able to do zooms on so we weren't at all prepared for any of that which was a rapid change and we had to really in two weeks we got right up to speed we had to learn the zooms we had to start you know pivoting all our events online because as a chamber being a business hub for everybody, we had a lot of federal and government information that we had to pass out to our members in the community. And Tim Murray, which is the CEO of the, of the chamber, decided that all this information would be going out, not just solely to our chamber members, because we're a member organization, but he wanted to help the community. So we you know, opened everything that we had, all our information and knowledge that we get, you know first hands that and as soon as we get it we try to send it out to the community um you know we just opened it up to everybody it was free for everybody and since then i mean little by little we have opened up the office um we are we are a small organization here there's only like seven of us here um so we all have individual offices but um some of us work remotely i personally work remotely um, until just this week, I've come in a couple of times, but I mean, if all the events are online, there's no sense for me to kind of come in the office, but our protocol is that if you step outside your office, the masks are required. Um, so yeah, pretty much the same as everybody. We're trying to stay COVID free here. Exactly. Uh, there's a question that just came in and maybe um, I can answer that. Uh, but before yeah. I do, I wanted, I wanted to also to throw out maybe a, a, a constructive conversation to have that we don't have a whole lot of time left would be um, for those for those of you who own businesses or in businesses 
Um, let's project ourselves to, again, six, 12 months from now, we're on the other side of this pandemic. Um, what lessons have you learned um, about how to do things better and how do you think you would implement them um, going forward to, again, mitigate and prepare um, for the next one? But um, think about that and maybe somebody can comment on that. And there's a question about if businesses were to follow more hospital-based cleaning protocols, do you believe it would create a safer work environment? Um, yes, I mean, you know, and I think a lot of businesses have been doing that. Um, but uh, uh, there's certain degrees of, of this. I mean, you know, the way that you stagger your, your workforce, the way that you do deep cleaning, the different kinds of deep cleaning, do you do fogging, do you do electrostatic? How often do you do it? Um, you know, fever screening, I'm not a big fan of that. It's okay to do, but I mean, don't rest your laurels on that. That's not, you know, a lot of, a lot of cases are gonna slip by because a lot of cases are asymptomatic. Um, but, but, you know, as an overall statement, overarching statement, yes. I mean, I think hospitals do a very good job pre-pandemic, we were doing this. I mean, every time we walked into a patient um, uh, room, uh, we used the, the, the solutions, the uh, antiseptic mm -hmm. solutions on the yeah. way in, on the way out. We say pump in and pump out. Um, you know, and, and, and by, by, by necessity, because of course we're a place that sick people come. Um, mm -hmm. But anything that you can do in the workforce to improve um, the cleanliness and that sort of thing will certainly help. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing, you know, it, and I think this is the experience of, of pretty much everybody. Think about over the last 12 months, Okay, when's the last time you were sick with anything? Mm -hmm. Cough, fever, anything. Um, I, I haven't been at all in 12 months. Um, and yeah. I think a lot of people haven't. So these things work, right? I mean, yes, we're, we're trying to protect ourselves from COVID, um, but we're not getting sick either. Now that's a whole nother yeah. long Topic. conversation. Yeah. Should we, should we do this forever? Um, there's the, yes and no. I mean, you'll protect yourself from illness, but then of course you'll have a very naive immune system um, because it's never seen anything. And then if something big comes up later on in life, you might not be able to uh, respond to it well enough. So that's a whole other topic, but it's just an illustration that, you know, these steps do work, right? I mean, we, yeah. we don't get sick. We, a lot of us, I mean, for the most part, don't get sick. Um, so does anybody have a thought or response to that? What, what are you... Um, even just when we're not out of it yet, the pandemic, but even just what you've learned now in the last 12 months, what will you do different for your business going forward? I don't know. And there's a question again from Judy and she says, have any other companies in the audience changed the way of their management in their leads? So if there's anybody in the audience um, regarding that as well, Dr. Cioto. I don't think so. I think Martha might want to say something. Yeah. So I can just make a comment. Um, I'm the executive director for the Worcester District Medical Society, and I've had a history of working in the hospitals. I was at St. Vincent for almost about 19 years and UMass for 10. And I've been here with the Medical Society for about three years. And um, what we've done, so our offices are located in Mechanics Hall, and we've had to work around their schedule. So for in large part, we've been working from home. We've had to transition all of our live you know, what we do here is we organize medical um, education events and we hold, um, we have 19 committees that organize all the different events that we organize throughout the year um, from women's events to public health activities and student events. Um, but what we've been able to do is work with the Department of Public Health here in Worcester to um, have people sign up for volunteer off, um, with different ways to volunteer, whether they're clinicians or not. Um, and so we've been able to, we've collaborated with the Department of Public Health to provide uh, a number of people. They're, they've expanded um, the hours of operation at the senior center up at, up at the old St. Vincent Hospital there. And, um, and so we've, that's, that's how we've been able to do it. We've obviously had to switch our, our um, events to virtual events, but we're hoping that we can manage something this summer um, when the weather's warmer to get together in person again. So, but we're here to help where the, we have 20, over 2,400 position members, including over 500 uh, medical students, residents and fellows in the city. Um, so if there's any way that we can help in terms of broadcasting information, promoting things on our website, public health for the community, um, we're here to help. Dr. Michael Hirsch is the um, chair of our public health committee. I think everyone in the world knows him at this point. <laughs> um, and Sparrow Spinakis is our president Giles Whalen is our vice president and Marianne Felice um, is our secretary. I think many of those names are known to everyone, especially at UMass. So. Yes. 
<laughs> Michael is an old and dear friend back from my training days. Yeah. Uh, he's a great, great guy. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for either? Or yeah, there's a question that came through. What effect would universal health care have? Benefits, drawbacks? I'm curious on your thoughts. Uh, boy, that's a can of worms. Uh, you know, if you're talking about, <laughs> if you're talking about universal health care um, in like in disaster preparedness or in the case of this pandemic, I mean, I'm I'm all for more access, better access for everybody. Um, you know, but I don't think that um, the like, for instance, the, the 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 low volumes that we've seen across the board in in non-surge um, areas for hospitals. Um, I don't think it's a reflection of, you know, access issues. I think it's a reflection of fear of infection. Um, but I think, you know, the, there are a lot of pros and cons that go well beyond my healthcare economics um, uh, uh, knowledge set um, and really should be talked about by other experts. But, um, I, you know, I'm all for uh, the more access, the better. I'm an emergency physician, right? I mean, our doors are always open. We don't really, um, uh, uh, you know, care uh, whether you have insurance or not. Uh, we will treat you. Um, but, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of other factors that, that build into that. I'm not sure how it would have affected or, or would affect the pandemic, you know, had we been a universal health care system versus not. I mean, you can look up at Canada. Um, I think um, uh, one of uh, um, uh, Daniel, I think it was, um, talked about that. I mean, they have a universal health care system. Um, initially, it actually Canada did very well with the infection. They um, uh, had very low numbers and now they're starting to catch up. Um, you know, UK as universal health care, they were not in the same boat as us, but not too far behind. So I'm not sure what kind of impact it would have had on this pandemic, if, mm -hmm. if that's the question. Mm -hmm. Comments? Comments? Questions? Any, yeah. Any other comments? Questions? Well, I'll have to first fact. If uh, someone, okay. Judy, just asked. Judy's our great reservoir of questions. Yes. <laughs> um, if you had the first vaccine, can you still get COVID? Oh, boy. She likes to throw the curveballs. So it's interesting. If you look at the two, uh, and I won't go into great detail. If you look at the two vaccines um, uh, in the U.S., uh, essentially the Moderna and the Pfizer, uh, there'll be more coming. Johnson Johnson, I think, is on, on track to be coming soon. Um, you know, they have similar um, uh, uh, effective rates, essentially, uh, protective rates. Um, but the, the two studies, the two New England Journal studies that were done on them, um, uh, unfortunately had slightly different um, uh, parameters the way they did the study. So I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, the Pfizer study, uh, don't quote me on this, I may have my days off a little bit, but the Pfizer study, I think, showed about 14 days after the first dose, uh, about 54, I think it was, percent uh, protection. And then um, an equal time after the second dose, up to about 95% protection. Um, and, then, and then the Moderna um, was, uh, there was only really one measure, but that was um, not seven, but 10 days after the first dose. And that actually showed a 94% efficacy. But you can't compare the two because the days were off. So the bottom line is, even if you get two doses of it, you can still get it. It's this idea of 94% protection. Um, and, and most of that protection is to severe disease. And that's why, you know, there's still the possibility in the height of the pandemic that you could transmit it. Um, whereas Johnson Johnson is showing a much higher um, rate of, of inability to transmit. Um, but, uh, I mean, the, the simple answer to the question without getting too technical is, uh, you know, yes, you can. It's very, very low, much lower likelihood that you would after the first vaccine, but it's possible. I think there's one other question that came up. There is one other one. Can you see it? Yeah. Have you any thoughts on why a lot of Asian countries have that influence beyond authority and the United States doesn't? Obviously, there are cultural differences, but are there any other factors? I am not going to get political, I mm -hmm. promise. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's as an overarching statement, it is all about, well, first of all, also understand that Asian countries have a, a culture of wearing masks that, that long predate this pandemic. Um, you know, the mask wearing was not such a, a new kind of novel thing to do. Uh, if people were sick or had any concern, they often wear, wear masks in, in many Asian countries. But having said that, um, there's different levels of this. Um, uh, one of them is the idea of the policymakers being able to convince us. And I think in democratic societies, um, it's really more about influence and authority because there is some authority but not as much as in other authoritarian countries. 
Um, so when there's not as much authority, you have to rely on the influence. You have to tell the truth. You have to learn, you know, from your science experts and your economic experts. These were two, you know, side by side crises. It was a healthcare crisis, and still is. It was certainly an economic crisis as well. And the two interact and they have to be dealt with um, together. And that why that's why you you assemble your team of subject matter experts, scientists, healthcare people, ec economists, etc. You take all the information, you assimilate it, and then you try to trans, you know, create policy, and then and then convey that policy uh, to the public in a way that that allows them to help themselves. Because the non pharmaceutical interventions phase of a pandemic. Okay, from when the pandemic starts to when you have effective therapeutics and vaccines and vaccine mediated herd immunity, it's all about that non pharmaceutical interventions, the mask wearing and the, and the social distancing. And, and that is the public saving itself. It's not like I'm a doctor and I can, you know, have a patient come in the ER and I can save that patient's life because, you know, that one doctor patient interaction it doesn't work that way. This is the public having to save itself. This is this is the, the almost a definition of public health, right? Um, so in order to do that, in order to get the public to save itself, wear masks, you know, et cetera, um, you have to have that influence in your leadership. There are some countries around the world that are very authoritarian. They may not have the influence, but they certainly have the authority, and they do it that way. They so they essentially enforce these things. Um, to, you know, that's not how we live in the United States. That's not how we want to live. So we have to, we have to balance that. So yep. it's kind of a long-winded answer to the question. Can I have a comment about that question? Um, thank you. So we had um, here again at the Medical Society, we had a, a conference um, back in November and it was um, about this. I don't know if this is part of it, but I do want to mention this tonight. I'll I'll hold all future comment, but maybe direct you to our website where the presentation is posted under the past events page. And it was dependence on China for medicines. Um, and we had a, a, an expert, she wasn't a, um, a physician, but Rosemary Gibson, who has presented in front of Congress on the subject. She has done a tremendous amount of research on, on the subject. And it was staggering for me to hear, I'm not a clinician, but she made it very understandable for, for laymen um, to realize that this is a really big upcoming issue. And it's something that, you know, the federal bodies will have to hopefully acknowledge and, and try to attack or try to tackle. Um, but anyway, WDMS.org, if you go to the past events page, it's um, dependence on China for medicines. And there's a, it's about an hour long video. We had a panel of experts, one person um, from the chief, um, Oh gosh, the chief uh, pharmacy officer from UMass was on our panel. We had someone from Tufts um, and uh, uh, the CMO, I'm sorry, the COO from uh, St. Vincent Hospital. She's done extensive research on the subject as well. So I found it very interesting. I'll stop there. No, oh, thank you for uh, sharing. The, thank you. The, the after action analysis of this pandemic is gonna be extremely complicated and very long. Um, many, many factors have to be looked at and scrutinized, um, and and quite frankly, we have to figure out how to do it better. Because um, I'll tell you, you know, my, my fellows hear this all the time when I when I teach or when I present at conferences, um, and I don't want to you know end on a on a bad or scary note, but um, it really concerns me um, the fact that you know, as I said in the beginning, we don't have muscle memory on how to do this, but we do have muscle memory on the fact that pandemics have been around and they can come around and they happen. You know, even SARS and MERS, right? The last two coronavirus pandemics, um, we did, never got a vaccine for, never got effective therapeutics for, uh, but they behave similar to COVID-19. The reason we didn't, however, get vaccines and therapeutics is because they just kind of petered out. We were lucky, okay? But listen, in the last what, 20 years, we've been through H1N1, um, you know, H5N1, SARS, MERS, um, 1968, Spanish flu, uh, oh, sorry, um, um, Hong Kong flu and all the others. You know, these are um, uh, not unprecedented. We know they can happen. We know they're out there. And here's the scary thing. If we don't do this right the next time, and really doing it right means this, to, 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 to prevent an outbreak from turning into a pandemic, there's essentially five different steps you have to do. There's um, identification, something new's out there. I, I'm suspecting there's something new, I'm not quite sure. Immediate containment, then verification. Okay, we saw, we think it's something new, we contained it, we, we isolated it. Now we're gonna verify, is it something new or not? 
If it's not, fine. If it's the old, variation of the old, fine. Don't contain it anymore. If it's new, at least you got it contained. Then you do the alert and the eradication, which involves several steps, right? So those, that's how you prevent an outbreak from going to pandemic. We have not seemed to be able to get it right. Now, we do it pretty well with Ebola. Ebola emerged in the 1970s. Um, and, and pretty much ever since it emerged, every time it emerged, emerges, we pounce on it. Locally, they pounce on it. WHO comes in and pounces on it. First case or two, they identify it, and boom, they isolate it. Done. Didn't happen in 2014. Why? Because it didn't come up in Central Africa, where it always comes up and can be recognized quite easily. It arose in West Africa, where there's also things like yellow fever, right? And some others, malaria, that looks a little bit like Ebola. And in the beginning, they said, oh, that's just what it is. And then suddenly realized it's Ebola, but now it's too far away to really contain. Now, that became epidemic, but not pandemic, because it was able to be contained in West Africa. And for the most part, didn't get a foothold anywhere else, though we were very, very close. And I spent some time on CNN arguing with some people um, that we should be isolating more of these healthcare workers coming back. Hold on the story. Um, but, but so at least that was able to be contained there. As much damage and as horrible as it was in West Africa, it was contained there. My fear is the nightmare scenario. If we don't get this right, um, you know, who knows when is it going to be, but if a novel virus emerges, okay, that has the, the R naught value, the, the uh, uh, level of, of contagious, how contagious it is, um, of not COVID, but something 10 times more contagious of COVID, like measles or mumps, okay, and has a case fatality rate of not COVID, which is about 1.1 to 6, depending on what percent, depending on what part of the world you're in, and of course varies by age as well, but instead has a case fatality rate of Ebola, which is 50 to 70%, or rabies, which is approximating 100% fatality, then I would argue that that would not only decimate our healthcare systems, um, decimate our economies, but that would actually threaten us as a species, yeah. um, kind of novel virus. And we're not too far away from it. We're not too far away. You can put those different levels I told you about, level of contagiousness and case fatality rate on different viruses, measles, mumps, rabies, Ebola. If something comes together, and has all those in one virus, we're in deep, deep trouble if we don't do this right the next time. So again, I don't want to leave you on a scary note, but we need to learn these lessons. So this is really, really important. And that's on the healthcare side, not so much on the business side, but we're all uh, in this. Learning field. our lessons when we're planning or preparing, it applies, whether you're in medical or you're in business. Right. Learn your lessons, don't do it again. Um, at this yeah. point, if there are no other questions, I actually would like to thank all of you for participating today. Um, it's been wonderful to have you with us. And if you think of other questions and you'd like to send them to us, you can send them either to myself or to Greg. Um, and we'd be more than happy to answer your questions. But thank you so much um, for participating. And thank you, Lily. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you, Dr. Ciazone and uh, Linda for presenting this uh, seminar this morning. I think there was a lot of information here, very, very helpful. And I too agree that we need to prepare a little bit better for the future. And I hope you're wrong on all those potential. <laughs> It's going to, you know, all this come together, hopefully not for everybody's sake, but um, thank you very much for your precious time. And thank you to TD Bank uh, for sponsoring the seminar. And again, a reminder, this seminar has been recorded. If anybody wants a copy of it, feel free to reach out to me at the chamber and I could connect you directly to our two presenters today. So, okay. Have a great day. Stay safe out there and um, stay warm. All right. Thank Wear you. Wear your mask. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye.